Good afternoon, and welcome to the Elizabeth A. Sackler Center for Feminist Art. I am Elizabeth A. Sackler, and I am happy to host uh, today's lecture uh, with Rusty Kanakogi. And uh, to let you know a little bit before we begin about the center, we opened in 2007 in March, so we're coming up on our second anniversary. And in addition to being an exhibition space for art and the beautiful dinner party by Judy Chicago, we are also an education facility. And this space enables us to fulfill a mission that I am very keen about, which is raising awareness of feminism's cultural contributions and educating new generations about feminist art and about the history of feminist thought. And uh, since, we've, since we have opened, we have had more than half a dozen critically acclaimed uh, exhibitions in uh, the center galleries. And we have hosted uh, scores of panel discussions and lectures, and uh, thousands of people have been in attendance. The world, as I guess we all know, works in mysterious ways. And when race car driver Danica Patrick became the first woman to win an IndyCar uh, race in Japan in 2008, uh, she made sports headlines at the, in the New York Times, and it caught my eye. And I took note, and I took note because I was a girl jock in the 1960s, and there was no WNBA. It wasn't even a twinkle in anybody's eye. In fact, there was no college basketball, which was terrible when I went off to college. And there was no women's tennis that was considered comparable or as important as men's tennis. It was before the Billie Jean King, Bobby Riggs match, which probably all of us watched with great gusto. And so I began to think about how wonderful it would be to have a month here of women in sports. We now have uh, significant uh, women doing significant things in all of the sports areas. Uh, that's not going to be happening this month, but I hope it will happen in a future month, one weekend after the next, after the next. So today is particularly important to me, and this is where the world is mysterious. I was at uh, the Center for Philanthropy at CUNY. My friend Kathy McCarthy is the uh, uh, um, head, the director there. And it was there that at a panel discussion that had nothing to do with sports that I met Milena Herring, who is the executive director of the Women's Sports Foundation. So I went up to her and I said, oh, I've been reading about Danica and I have this great idea and this is what I'd like to do at the center. And so, in addition to her telling me a lot about, and my learning a lot about the importance of the work that the Women's Sports Foundation is doing, she also invited me to Women's Sports Foundation Annual Benefit, which if you haven't been, you must go. It fills the entirety of the Waldorf Astoria Ballroom. And it was uh, such a high. It was such an incredible high. And of course, last year there was um, enormous excitement because all of the women athletes who had just come from Beijing were there. And it was just, uh, it was just thrilling. I think, um, however, that the most auspicious part of that evening for me was being seated next to Reina Rusty Kanakogi. And in addition to having the pleasure, pleasure of watching and hearing some young women athletes and some older women athletes coming up to Rusty one after the other to say hello, to say thank you, and all other expressions of awe and appreciation, I had the pleasure of her company, and we, I thought, were pretty good dinner mates that night. It was really wonderful, and I, it, we hit it off. But I feel like it's easy to hit it off with you, Rusty, because you are a gem. You are just an incredible gem in this world. And by the end of the evening, it felt as if we had known one another for a really, really long time. And I asked her before we left that evening if she would come and speak at the center, and she said she would. And here we are today. And uh, we send out from the foundation, from the Elizabeth A. Sackler Foundation, email blasts uh, when I have invited somebody to come. And we don't usually uh, get any particular responses. Uh, well, 
not this time, Rusty. It was amazing how many people's lives have been touched by you that I know. And I didn't know that. And here are some of the responses that came back. Barbara Dobkin wrote, I regret being unable to, to attend one of your programs. I love Rusty. I even own a black belt, she signed. <laughs> I'm glad to hear that she'll be at the museum. Sending her and you my very best. And from Judy Chicago's biographer, Gail Levin, she wrote, I have a class at 10.30 that morning, which will be a studio visit, so I hope I'll be able to go, but I doubt it. I did interview Rusty, Lee Krasner's niece, and she is terrific. All the best, Gail. And from a former BMA board member and collector, Sue Stoffel, she wrote, she was my judo teacher at Dwight from 1969 to 1975. You can tell her I am one of her greatest fans. She left a lasting impression on a young female adolescent growing up in the hellhole, which was New York at the time. Just three that came back. Early in my career, writes Rusty, I defied the rules of gender by competing with men. It was tolerated until I began to win. When banned in the competition, she says, I vowed this would never happen to a female again. Thank you for that. Her bio is as long and wonderful and as important in the sports arenas as Gloria Steinem's. Rusty went on to become international and national coach and international referee and an advocate and promoter of the sport. In the 1988 uh, Olympics in Seoul, Korea, she was the USA women's judo coach and it was the first inclusion of women's judo in the Olympics ever. Uh, three U.S. women athletes competed, and uh, resulting uh, in one silver medal and one bronze medal. 1976 to 79, international coach. 1974 to 96, national coach. When she was coaching, the USA was number one in the world when she was the solo coach of those teams. She was the N NBC judo uh, commentator in 2004 for the Olympics in Athens, Greece and a media panelist for the International Judo Federation in Cairo, Egypt in 2005. Rusty apparently, and I have no reason to believe it isn't so, has taught more than 100,000 people at every level. Colleges include Pratt, John Jay School of Criminal Justice, Brooklyn College, the high schools are private and public for kids at risk, elementary school, and she continues to be an advocate for all athletes in judo and Title IX, which of course we know is gender equity in education. Rusty is our shiro and our pioneer. She organized the first women's world championship held in Madison Square Garden in 1980. She campaigned and litigated for women's judo inclusion in the Olympic Games and every level of competition, including Olympic sports festivals and the uh, US Olympic Committee Training Center in Colorado Springs. Her awards include a presidential award from the Women's Sports Foundation. She's been inducted into the Women's Sports Foundation International Hall of Fame. She has a medal from the International Judo Federation, World Pioneer uh, Women's Judo 2003, inducted into the New York Public School Athletic League Hall of Fame in 2003, also in a Lifetime Achievement Award from the New York Athletic Club, and I'm running out of breath. <laughs> it's marvelous. Recent awards include a Lifetime Achievement from the New York Athletic Club organizers at the New York Open Judo Championships, and um, Rusty received from the Emperor <coughs> and Country of Japan an honor of the Rising Sun Award last November 2008, which was, um, that's sort of how we hit it off. I received an invitation. And it was one of the most moving, and I'm sure your family is here to attest to it, the most moving and important 
uh, events that has taken place, I know how thrilled you were, and it was really a pleasure to be a part of that, and I thank you. Brooklyn Borough President, Marty Markowitz. Yay, Marty, named November 24th, the Rena Rusty Kanakoki Celebration Day in Brooklyn. So we now have a rusty day in Brooklyn. <laughs> and also there is an endowment in her name at the International Sports Foundation to assist in the development of women's judo. Uh, that began in 2008. Obviously, she has been featured in Sports Illustrated, and I sort of wrote down, not in the swimsuit edition, and then I thought, oh, I don't want to be, you know, risque. <laughs> she has been, of course, on cable and national news, and she has lists of newspaper and magazine articles. And just to close this wonderful circle of our universe, um, being here at the Brooklyn Museum at the Elizabeth A. Sackler Center for Feminist Art, um, Rusty is Lee Krasner's niece. And she was involved with the Krasner Pollock Foundation. She says she's a watchdog, keeping <laughs> sure that the grants that go out are in equal measure, gender-wise. And she was in the documentary on Jackson mm -hmm. Pollock in 2005, and I think the only thing we're missing is a documentary about you, Rusty, Raina Rusty Kanakoga. Please help me welcome her and this wonderful <laughs> Elizabeth, I'm tired. I'm, I've done that much. <laughs> well, thank you all for being here today to help celebrate Women's History Month. And I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Elizabeth Sackler and uh, Rebecca for all the great help and uh, allowing me to uh, share my story with you. I see many of uh, my friends and family in the audience. Thank you for being here. And uh, with the schedule and all the things that we're preoccupied with, maybe this is the best way to get together. <laughs> the, uh, the story is going to be a little different, probably, than uh, you expected, because I'm going to tell the truth. <laughs> <laughs> Firstly, the name is incredible. I started out in the Daily Mirror many, many years ago, I was referred to as a female launching pad. I graduated to the queen of judo, and now I'm the mother of judo. I've been called a lot of mothers over the past 50 years, escalating uh, what I believed in was justice and equality in my sport. The um, presentation will have PowerPoint, different photos, and then I can elaborate and work around those and give you a little bit of the background of what gave me the incentive and how I was raised and my experiences to give me the uh, simple word, it's Japanese, I hope you understand it, chutzpah, <laughs> so really push and uh, not be able to take no as an answer. Uh, the, um, we're going to start off the PowerPoint with uh, childhood. Well, that's a little older. <laughs> uh, now, I think I was about the, the photo and the stroller. That stroller is probably in the Smithsonian Institute. <laughs> the, the, I must have been all of two years old, but the attitude was there. There's no doubt about who I was and how I was, com how I was going to face the world. The photo uh, with my mother, uh, as you could see, even though it was time of the Depression, I was eating well. <laughs> what? I don't know, but uh, I guess uh, with all the potatoes and bread, they made sure that I wasn't starving. And we were sitting on a uh, porch in uh, Coney Island, actually, that address, we lived at Six Kister Court, which no longer exists. It's right off West 8th Street. 
but it's about one block away from the beach and uh, right about two minutes away from the, all the rides. Um, before we go to the, actually the photos up, but I just wanted to talk a little bit about Coney Island and the childhood. And some of you will go down memory lane with me. Basically, as a kid, uh, what was available to me was the usual. You go to school and you uh, try to follow the rules, but Coney Island was a unique experience because in, just in, in the building we were in, the small uh, two-family house, it was for transients. People would come to work Coney Island. Uh, you were acquainted with uh, the people in the different shows, whether it be um, the, the Sword Swallower or Milo the Mule Face Boy or the Mermaid. Uh, there were different characters that you got to know, you weren't afraid of, you spent time with them, they seemed ordinary to you, and yet people were paying money to see them. I was getting an education from school, but I was also getting an education from the street. Uh, my family uh, was, uh, at the time, and for a long time, uh, they weren't, comp my mother and father weren't compatible, but at that time there was no such thing as divorce, and uh, they stayed together, and I was the messenger in the kitchen, and the messenger was, you tell him, and then you tell her, and this, this is in the same room, so I was sort of like, a, it was a, a constant ping pong game. So, sort of a, a, a toughness was growing, that I had to deal with this type of uh, relationship. And um, the, the physical, the negative physical part was, I think, when once in a while when there was some violence, except it worked in my favor, uh, when a ketchup bottle was thrown and I didn't duck. It wasn't at me, but I didn't duck and I got clobbered with it. And all of a sudden, it had mom and dad speaking to each other to find out if I was dead. Or, how, I said, that's good, you know, and then the ketchup dripping off my head. So it was that kind of relationship. But uh, it was building something in me, uh, I guess, a resentment and unrest, obviously a dysfunctional family and how to deal with that. Um, at one point, uh, it was a matter of, I thought this was a normal life. And the only life that I could know of was going to the movies and seeing some of the characters. And the characters, is said, wait a minute, there's another life. People are dancing and happy and getting along and not fighting and not throwing ketchup bottles at each other. And I said, wait, something, I, I'm, in, I'm in the wrong life over here. Uh, other than that, my friends, uh, they had problems too. Either the father had a gambling problem or a problem with alcohol. But in those days, there was always something negative going on and uh, it was tough for a kid to know how to deal with it. Uh, Coney Island background was really handy for me because at one point during World War II, they had what was called Mardi Gras. And um, that was usually in September and that would be sort of the end of the Coney Island season and it would also uh, have many military people there, soldiers, sailors, everybody having a good time, a lot of girls looking for boyfriends and boyfriends looking for girlfriends and uh, movie stars and so forth. And that's when I made my most money because I enjoyed working. That was the only way I could get some money. And my job, my mother came up with the idea of selling confetti. And uh, recently I explained to uh, a friend of mine from Japan what confetti was, because why would people want to throw paper at each other? But <laughs> it, it uh, a part of the celebration. And as a uh, eight-year-old, I remember having a cardboard box. Several people worked for my mother and my father at the time. They spoke because now they were in business together. And it was a cardboard box with a string through either side and 
hang it on the neck and fill up the bags of uh, the, the bags with confetti and uh, my mother great entrepreneur pushed the bottom of the bag up so she could put less confetti in and nobody would be wiser and she could make more money well certainly I just I was only the messenger here and as the eight-year-old um, I already knew that I had to be different. I was the only girl doing this. She had boys working for her, um, and there were other people on the street with the confetti business, and I knew I had to be different. And I had to make these sales, because the more I would sell, I would ha be able to earn and keep um, my commission. Well, at the time, they came out with homogenized milk, and I said, okay, I'm going to turn this into a good business. So I was barking at the time. Get your homogenized confetti here, homogenized confetti. And people were buying it. They didn't have a clue what it was. But it was homogenized, and that was the latest thing. So that was my homogenized confetti. I also knew that people that were in a bar drinking uh, would be a little looser with their change and I could sell them. And being a girl with two pigtails, freckles, little chunky, going around, I was already appreciated by the public because, oh, look at that little girl, you know. Well, with that, I went into the bar at Feltman's, which was a long, long bar. And who do I happen upon? And I went right over to him and with my confetti box and tried to sell my homogenized confetti. Well, he pulled out a dollar and he gave it to me. And he didn't even ask for the confetti. It was Lon Chaney. Oh. And he was with this big buxom blonde and uh, it, it was just like a movie. And I had my dollar and I know I didn't have to turn that into my mother. But here I was at eight years old already working the street. I knew the homogenized, I knew getting the gimmicks, the, the different um, people that worked in Coney Island. I was monitoring them, see how they did things. Half of it was a scam, half of it was um, uh, hard work, but for the most part, it was survival. And that education started pushing me in the direction, tolerance for people that maybe had uh, that was Milo the Mule Face Boy, who incidentally, I was thrilled to death, I thought it was a movie star because after I got to know him, um, every time they put him in front of the uh, show to, to entice the people to come in, uh, he would look at me and sing, and I was just a child, he would just sing, let me call you sweetheart. And to me, I said, wow, I'm, I'm he selected me, this is fantastic. And the poor man, um, actually he, he, had, he was retarded and had buck teeth, so they turned him into Milo the Mule Face Boy. But that was Coney Island. You took what you could, you exaggerated it, you convinced people this was somebody to, to deal with and see. So that was part of the education. Uh, the rides, my mother worked in uh, Luna Park. Actually, uh, we were there during the first Great Fire, and uh, I remember the Dragon's Gorge. That's where the fire started, and that was right across from, not the street, but the alleyway, where the uh, the concession she worked in was. She worked for a man by the name of Mr. Jaffe, and uh, he was a nice man. And I remember from. Uh, probably May through September, my daily meal was hot dog, root beer, and french fries. And didn't get better than that. And that was the way it was. Plus, with my mother's connections to all the rides, I was Rosie's daughter, I can go on any ride I wanted. And the kids in the neighborhood all wanted to be my friend because if they tagged along, they, I can get them on the ride. And this is eight, nine, ten years old. The day of the fire, uh, I remember being in Steeplechase Pool, and once I realized there was a fire, I went into a panic because I knew 
uh, they said it was at Dragon's Gorge, this ride, and I said, oh, my God, my mother is right next door. My mother, and I ran, no shoes, my little bathing suit on from the pool, which was approximately a block and a half away, but within the park, to try to reach my mother, to save my mother, to find her. And uh, as I was en route, one of the one burly cop grabbed me and he said, no, no, you can't go there, that's dangerous. So I was in a panic and ran around in circles and uh, crying and didn't know what to do. And when I finally ran home, which was about three blocks away, and when I got there, by the door, there was a parrot and several cartons of cigarettes. I said, my mother must be okay. How did, how did this get here? Well, it seemed the fire was going on and the bar next door, my mother rescued the parrot. She's also rescued several cartons of cigarettes for her. <laughs> so I knew everything was okay, but she actually prob went to find me. So there was always something going on and there was, um, I wouldn't call it so much wheeling and dealing, but there was opportunity um, and you took advantage of it. Um, without uh, too much of breaking the law. Maybe little improprieties there, but nothing too serious, because after all, she was just rescuing the cigarettes. I mean, she wouldn't know what to do with them. <laughs> she wouldn't know what to do with them later. So, <laughs> uh, so actually, uh, the, the Coney Island part of my life was um, an education, a lot of negative, but a lot of positive. Um, as I was growing up, before sports, uh, I, I really looked up to my brother. He, uh, the household was like this. I slept with my mother in one bedroom, and my father and brother were in the, what, the living room, and they each had their own bed, and then there was the kitchen, and then there was the hallway and the bathroom that we shared with uh, the landlord and the landlady. And that's a whole other story. That has to be in the book. <laughs> uh, so, and then of course we, we had a, a dog and it would be, uh, the dog would be my best friend and the dog would be my way of always uh, playing doctor and the dog would be my patient and the poor thing was taped up more than anything. And uh, what I did to poor Tootsie, I remember getting a nickel and I wanted to buy Tootsie a gift, so I went to the five and ten and I did buy Tootsie a gift and everybody looked at us and laughed and couldn't figure it out. Well, the only thing I could afford was this thing in a, in a little carton and it cost five cents and I tied, it looked lovely and I tied it around Tootsie's neck and paraded her all over the place with it and unbeknownst to me, it was a sanitary napkin. <laughs> It was, to me, it was a decoration, and I didn't know. And then uh, another time with poor Tootsie, what I did was my mother had uh, one lipstick in her whole life, Cody, and I found it, and I decided Tootsie needed lips. So there goes the lipstick. So I, I really, Tootsie was my best friend for a long, long time. Um, it was hard to have too many friends because as I grew up, um, the um, Jewish girls in the neighborhood, I started becoming a bad kid, so the mothers would not let them play with me after a while. They said, no, no, you have to study, let her go her way. And um, I took the Christian girls and later on we formed a gang because it was time to make sure we can register our turf we knew the boys had a gang, and we knew that it was time for the girls to have a gang and be able to take care of themselves, and if necessary, uh, put their energy in the direction if they wanted to fight, to arrange a fight. And that's basically what you did. It was an arrangement, uh, after school arrangement, or you would find there was only one other girl gang. We were the Apaches. There was another gang called the Scarlets, and that was an African-American gang. And we were the um, uh, six Christian, one Jew gang. <laughs> Worked out well. Uh, we, the, the fight was, okay, we're gonna meet in the schoolyard and have our fight. And we had our uniforms, and so clever. 
You didn't wear your official jacket, which was a beautiful satin chartreuse and black jacket. When you're going to war, you wore your uniform. What was your uniform? A navy type of sweater that had um, uh, some kind of an oil in it. I think uh, if anybody was either in the service or in shops at Models, uh, it's very strong. You can't pull it off because girls, when they fight, one of the first things they do is rip off the shirt because then you're in your underwear and or bare chested and then you can't fight if you're covering up. And the other thing is the hair was tied back either in a ponytail or braids. You took Vaseline on your face, on your arm, so when they went to scratch you, it would come off. So <laughs> a, lot, a lot of things you, you uh, either invent or figure out and do, and that was very effective. And the uh, pants were bell bottoms at the time. Um, I remember going to uh, schoolyard at PS 100. We had this fight schedule, organized fight, and um, I couldn't find my gang. So I said, they're probably over there. I gave them the credit for being there. Well, I show up, and the Scarlets are there, and nobody else except a couple of the boyfriends of the Scarlets, the older fellas. And I go, uh-oh, I have a, pro have a problem here. And I noticed they had umbrellas. That was, uh, it wasn't raining, but there were a couple people with umbrellas. I said, that's going to be a weapon. Now, I had a weapon, however, I didn't have it on that day. Uh, when my brother was in the Marines, he gave me a gift of a bayonet. And I, <laughs> and I with, with two garters, I used to have it uh, attached to my leg. And never had to use it, but just the fact that I had it and people knew I had it was, don't go near her, be careful. She has that bayonet on, and, and probably, probably a bayonet on one leg and a Tommy gun on the other leg. Which, <laughs> But it was, it was enough to intimidate, and uh, I found that, you know, innuendo and intimidation when you need it sometimes works. And uh, to cut through to the, to the uh, fight while I was there, uh, the umbrellas came out. All of a sudden, I'm being whacked with umbrellas, and people are swinging wildly, and I'm trying. I'm swinging wildly, and uh, this was the first time I, I wanted to hear the police siren. You know, I said, oh, where are they? And fortunately, um, this, a woman saw what was going on and she called the cops and oh, I was happy when I heard that. Ah, I said, oh, thank God. Because it was like six, two boyfriends and uh, one of the boyfriends made sure his jacket opened so I could see his zip gun. So I was damned if I did and <laughs> damned if I didn't at that point. And everybody scattered and of course uh, the, the rule on the street when they said, what's going on? Because everybody scattered but I was still standing there. What's going on? It's nothing. Yeah. Nothing. What do you mean nothing? There was everybody's running in all directions. What's the problem? Are you hurt? You know, I probably was scratched and so forth. Well, anyway, later on um, that day, I went step by step and found my guy. Well, they all chickened out, but step by step I found them, and step by step I, I had to beat them up a little bit <laughs> <laughs> to teach them they shouldn't do that. Then after that they behaved. So our it wasn't like the gangs of nowadays, but <clears throat> the point of that story was organization and counting on people and uh, responsibility. And had, had uh, something more serious happened to me, it was my responsibility. I walked into it with my eyes open. So that was my sport. There wasn't anything for girls to formally do. We had our street games. The boys always picked me first. Um, I was strong. Uh, my brother was uh, my role model. He, uh, he lifted weights. He would look in the mirror and say, how do I look, kid? And of course, I'd have to say, great, otherwise he'd hit me. So I uh, <laughs> had no choice. Uh, so I was following his example. He was an athlete to a certain degree. Uh, sports were available to him in school and he was eight years my senior, nothing available to me. I remember um, wearing uh, these rompers in school in seventh grade, eighth grade, and um, what they had, uh, the, the rompers itself were incredible. I don't know why we put it on. We didn't need to really change our clothes for the amount of work the girls were doing <laughs> because they, they didn't really want to do anything. And then 
I remember when we did play volleyball and I spiked the ball, everybody closed their eyes, hit their head, and that was it, and I was all alone. Uh, when we played with the boys battle ball or dodgeball, that was great because you could run up to the line, you could take the ball, and you could smash the person. And they expected everybody to run back, but I would stand by the line and give me your best shot, and they wouldn't, and I would just catch it, pull it into me, and there I was right next to them, and i get it back. Some of you, I'm sure, experienced that too. So I start getting daring in sports. Um, I like being strong. It had nothing to do with being fit. There was no such thing at the time. It was just strong. I was getting more aggressive. I was getting more hostile because of the family life, the chip on the shoulder watching the movie and saying, hey, there's another life. That's not my life. Something's wrong here. My role models from the radio, who did I like? Joe Lewis, boxing, strong guy. <laughs> Movies, who did I really like? Dillinger, Ma Barker, Babyface Nelson. And then when I found out um, uh, Lepsky, I believe, oh, yeah. some, some big gangster in Coney Island, um, I said, wow. Jews could be tough, gangsters. Now I was, get, I was getting all these role models. And it, it, I, I was definitely going in the wrong direction. But there wasn't a right direction. There wasn't sports. Um, um, the role models, basically, the women, the women that I knew was my mother, some of her friends, um, the mothers of my friends from my gang, and the, these. Women were victims because their husbands also had problems. Um, and so there was nobody to look up to. Once in a while on the news you'd see uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, and, uh, but you could not relate. I mean, how could I possibly relate to Eleanor Roosevelt? Uh, Babe Dietrichson, that was, well, she was, a, she was a, a, almost like a ghost because she was special. She was the only one, and who could live up to that? So it had nothing to do with being an athlete. It was, you're, you're in a bind, you don't know what direction to go, you're reaching out, you're striking out, uh, you know you have something burning in you, but you really can't identify it. Uh, you don't expect anything for nothing. Work was great for me. I worked since I was eight years old on the books when I was 16, and I was able to earn my keep because there wasn't any private or personal income for me to do anything. When I wanted something, I worked for it. I worked I, at jobs that you couldn't believe, selling water, selling ice water. The buses came in from Philadelphia. Uh, people were drinking gin all the way to fill from Philadelphia. They got off the bus, they were thirsty, nobody gave them a glass of water uh, because of their race. So. I had a business, anywhere between three cents and five cents a glass of water. It was the same glass, had a big keg of ice, and uh, people bought my water. And I earned $10 on Saturday and $10 on Sunday. I could go shopping, I can go downtown Brooklyn to Martin's and shop till I drop. Um, the, the funny thing is once I got into the business, then other people came into the business, and now we're gonna have a turf war. But it went further than that because I, um, I let everybody know that the stand next to me, or a little bit down, that their grandmother, they washed their grandmother's bloomers in that water. <laughs> and, and I thought, you know, okay, now we're going to start with the manipulation. And then somehow a praying mantis landed on my big chunk of ice, and people came over and said, what's, what's that? And I said, where my family comes from in Russia. This is the best sign, this is the best good luck you can possibly have. Actually, this is my grandfather reincarnated. <laughs> <laughs> and it worked. I was selling more water than I, 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 I could handle. So this is all before 15, 16 years old. So I was on the way. The uh, sports part, it was still street sports, nothing in school. I tried to get it. The, the sport was street fighting. Um, I was able to uh, convince uh, the science teacher who um, after school did a program. Uh, he also 
taught boxing. Um, I convinced him to teach me how to hit the heavy bag and uh, got into a little bit of boxing. So um, instead of just throwing my punches wildly, I could really throw a pretty good punch and hit the heavy bag. And I loved hitting the heavy bag because it was an outlet and had this churning, burning. When I went roller skating, instead of just roller skating to the music, I turned it into roller derby, trying to knock everybody in the skating rink <laughs> off. It, it could never be anything normal. It had to be physical. It had to be aggressive. It had to be attack. It had to be win. Uh, no direction to go. Finally, uh, I met a man who uh, actually uh, was, had this white round thing tied up with a yellow belt. And I asked him, I said, what's that? It was just a very unusual looking thing. And he said, that's my judo gi. I said, what the heck is that? Because the only thing I knew about the Japanese were from World War II, from the news, from the movies, <laughs> didn't, um, the, even, even the uh, impression, the visible impression was everybody uh, looked like uh, uh, Tojo or Hirohito at the time, and uh, uh, it was a country, strange country someplace, and we were at war with them, and uh, uh, we had a big war, and we won the war, and it was uh, a terrible <coughs> war on both sides, but I really, really didn't, uh, know too much about Japan, or for that matter, I didn't know too much about anything outside of Coney Island and Brooklyn. Well, he told me it was his judo gi, and I said, well, what do you do with it? And he says, well, we, we throw people. I said, well, that's, that's great. Uh, I said, I, I usually punch people, but I've never thrown anybody. Uh, how do you do that? And he uh, without the gi, he put that down, he just put his arm around my waist and picked me up on his hip and, uh, and held me there like it was a piece of paper and I, I had to outweigh him by at least 40 pounds. And he put me down and he said, how'd you do that? It was magic. And, and I, it was unbelievable how little effort on his part. Well, I think he did it again, he actually did it probably twice. And I said, I want to learn that. How do I learn it? And he said, well, you can't, he said, because uh, I work out at uh, a YMCA in Brooklyn, and uh, it's no, no girls, no women. He said, I have to learn that. Well, that was it. I, it. The seed was planted. It was something I wanted. It was something I had to go after. And at the time, I was at a Prosser Park YMCA, which uh, had a woman's night on Wednesdays, and they were uh, they had a combination of trampoline and rings and medicine bowl and basketball and different exercises. And the uh, physical uh, education director there, uh, after my participation, realized that I was strong, I was aggressive, I could do a lot of the, the, the skills very quickly. And he asked me to assist him. And uh, I said, sure, because this way I, I didn't have to pay. It was you know, something I could do. After um, I was there a while, I mentioned that the Brooklyn Central YMCA had a judo program, that I wanted to get in that judo program. And he called over there and they said, no women allowed in, in the whole building. So he explained to the director there, uh, Mr. Kern, he said, well, she's different. She's unusual. She's strong. She's blah, blah, blah. And they said, no, it doesn't matter. No women, period. Well, finally Mitchell, uh, Lauren, uh, Lauren Mitchell, came up with the idea. He said, you know, how about, let's make this a YMCA project. Here's the deal. If we can get you into, if I can convince Renee Kern to let you into the Brooklyn Central YMCA to learn judo in order for you to come back and teach it at whatever you learn, at the Prosper Park YMCA the following week. Maybe we can do a deal. Well, it worked. And they let me in, and at the time, uh, you had to earn your judo uniform. My friend was a yellow belt, so he already had earned his uniform. 
we, the beginner, had to wear an army fatigue. Uh, cut down, the sleeves cut, just like the judo uniform. Same thing with the trousers. The metal buttons cut off and a clothesline rope to go around your waist two times. And that was the uniform. Well, that was fine. If they said, come in your pajamas, that would have been okay with me too. Uh, as long as I can get in there. And I show up the first night and uh, of course, there's no place to change. So uh, I didn't even have a uniform at the time. I actually just had regular clothes on. And it was 40 men and some of them were advanced and there were only a handful of beginners and myself. And you can imagine the air in that room, in that dojo, on that mat, the looks. Uh, fortunately, I was tall, uh, pretty well-built, strong looking. Uh, I didn't sashay in like a, I was a flower, so. Um, and I didn't walk in like I was gonna take, take all these men on single-handedly either with an attitude. Just went in nice and calmly. And uh, that was the beginning, on the mat, uh, I didn't know where to stand, I didn't know how to bow, I didn't know any of that stuff. So I kind of hung out at the end and followed the leader, and um, that's the way it worked. Well, those sessions, those classes, the once a week, and then going back teaching the following week, I had three women. They were, that was the beginning of the actual <laughs> teaching career. So I was teaching as I was learning, uh, which is a pretty good way to do something, too. Uh, I knew I had to work harder than anybody in the class because when we're doing push-ups, corner of the eye watching me. When I was falling, corner of the eye watching. And I, I got the respect of the majority of men in the class. And basically, there were a handful that just kind of didn't want me there. They probably didn't know why. They just, you know, this is our territory and get out, but never said it to me. Had they, I would have probably uh, went back to Coney Island street fighting and <laughs> did them in. So that was the beginning. That same YMCA uh, had a team. Uh, out of the 40 students, there was usually a, a handful, maybe six, seven people that were the official team. And they would compete locally and um, regionally to see who would be going up to the state championship finals. And the state championship finals, because YMCA judo was a big deal at that time, uh, not because there weren't really too many clubs. And what happened was I trained as hard, worked as hard, they had their team formed, Brooklyn Central YMCA made it into the finals. They were going to compete in Utica, New York at the state championship. I wasn't going to be part of the team. I wasn't part of the former competitions, uh, but I was gonna go up and root for the team, be part of it that way. A couple days before the actual competition and training, um, one of the team members got hurt. Uh, captain asked me, would you like to compete? Well, I was thrilled. I never in a million years thought I would be invited onto this team because I looked at the team, I, I believe I was a green belt at the time. And these were black belts and brown belts. So I mean, just rank wise, I was, I was in awe of everyone. And plus technically some of them were really good and a couple of them, even though they were brown belts, I was basically, uh, I, I would say I was equal at least. And they didn't, the captain uh, didn't tell me, make sure your hair's short. My hair was short. Uh, make sure your shoulders are big. They were big. Um, at the time, men could wear a t-shirt under their uniform because especially if they were hairy chest, when you were gripping, they would get their hair pulled. So nobody thought, a second thought about uh, having a t-shirt underneath, which naturally I would have to do. Went up to Utica. The idea of the ace bandage around my chest was my idea. Not that I was so well endowed at the time, but it, I figured healthy pectoral muscles were at least what I could uh, get away with rather than, you know, sticking out boobs. So it wasn't too difficult. I uh, got the ace bandage, the t-shirt, I was really raring and ready to go. 
and finals. They line us up, two teams. Uh, everybody's eyeballing each other. Uh, no one's talking about me, whether female, male, irrelevant. Uh, the other team, I don't think, had a clue. My team is not talking about anything. Our, incidentally, uh, at that point, our teacher had passed away, so the captain was in charge. Um, we go into our competition. I was told by the captain to pull a draw. Don't think of competing, just pull a draw. Now, in team competitions, that's important because the strategy, you have this ace who's going to win and that one, he's borderline, but a draw is very important. So, okay, I'll, I'll do the best I can. Although, a draw means that you kind of have to fight defensively. Nowadays, you get big penalties for that, but in those days, you can do that and get away with it. Our team won, uh, say, one match, got a half point in the second match, lost the third, and so on. So we were winning anyway, whether I won my match or not. My draw would have certainly helped them. If I, if I lost, it may have been a problem. Well, my time came, this fella came up, I went up to the boundary line, we bowed in, and everything that the captain told me and what my thought my plan was going to be went out the window. Soon as we bowed and touched, I threw. <laughs> I couldn't wait. I went for I went one hundred percent and why I did that? Because I was so scared. I was afraid. I said if I was afraid I didn't want to lose. And the only way not to lose is to win. So uh, that's what I did, and I surprised myself, I surprised my team, I surprised my opponent, and, and then I followed the throw, not just standing, I followed it down to the mat, uh, and just smashed. And then I got up and, like, you know, this is something I do da on a daily routine, like this was normal for me, and we bowed out, and I imagine my face was pretty red, and went back, uh, and uh, everybody I, gave me you know, an a girl, but without saying it, and uh, uh, then I think there was one more match and we won, and they gave us the win, the referee, uh, central referee gave us the win, and uh, then we lined up, and we got our medals, each one of us got a gold medal, and the other team got the silver medal, and then the team trophy, the tournament director, which was the YMCA director, gave the team trophy to the captain. And we were supposed to have a big celebration dinner, and we were all happy and carrying on. And uh, next thing I know is someone comes over to me and said, uh, uh, Mr. So-and-so wants to see you in his office. And I just had a feeling, and I said, uh-oh. So I didn't have the trophy, but I did have the medal on my neck. And uh, I went into the office, and it was the tournament director. And he said, uh, look me, no hello, nothing. He said, are you a girl? And I looked at him and I said, yes, I'm a girl. He said, well, you're going to have to give back your medal, otherwise we're going to take the team trophy away. So I just stood there. I, I had no feeling whatsoever. It was, I felt cold. Um, I took the medal off and I put it in his hand. When I walked back into the uh, dojo area, my teammates can see there was no medal. And they, hey, what happened to us? So I said, ah, no big deal. I said, uh, he knows I'm a girl. He said, what? Uh, you know, I mean, no one said you can't be a girl. So I was being punished for being a female, actually. That was punishment. Uh, there was nothing in the rules, nothing spelled out. And they, the team, you could tell. And on one, one part of me felt really uh, depressed um, because my team's spirit, even though they were the champions, the state champions, their spirit went down. And now I start cracking jokes and making fun out of it and to try to cheer them up. Uh, but in my mind, my, from the cold feeling to joking around, um, I had two feelings. One, I was really pissed off. Two, 
I said, this can never happen to another female again. And I put that on the back burner. I didn't know what I was going to do. I didn't have a plan, but I just knew it was a horrible feeling and women should never have to experience this, ever. And I continued training. I don't know what I was training for. Training, training, training for the love of judo. I like what judo did for me. I like the extended family. I like the self-discipline. It was taking me away from the negativities. Uh, I was turning the bad into good. Uh, I was helping other people by teaching women. Uh, their husbands and boyfriends came up and said, hey, we like this, we want to do it too. Start teaching them. Then had children's classes. So I was teaching from the time I was almost a beginner. And that helped me uh, with my technique and learning. But here I was doing this training without a purpose, without a goal, um, because I didn't realize I was on a mission. Uh, after uh, YMCA, uh, then I was able to uh, get into private club, and this is one of the teams I was on, and uh, my sensei is right in the middle, Mr. Saiganji. Um, and you could tell, I don't, I'm the one with the red circle. And, <laughs> uh, but you could see it wasn't too hard to blend in being a male because of the height, because of the, the uh, the way uh, training, you kind of get a little thin in the face. And uh, I fit right in. Uh, this was a tough team. We, we had inter-club competition, and I believe you can see the team trophy. So we did pretty good. Uh, the next uh, photo, uh, another team. And again, uh, still being the only female. But none of these guys ever took it easy on me, which I'm grateful for. Uh, because if they did, they would be on the bottom, not me. Uh, they, um, the, the respect was not necessarily how they treated you, it was, was how they played you. So it wasn't a tickle. It was always a tough randuri, which is free play, and or a fight. At that time, beside the YMCA championship, uh, the most competitions were inter-club, and uh, I was a, uh, a viable member of uh, my team at that time, whatever club I was in. Now, this is uh, in Japan, 1962. Uh, I'm in the back. Uh, you could see the heavy-duty people. These are all legends of judo, especially in the first uh, team. The uh, first uh, line on the benches. Uh, these are the top senseis in Japan. I was fortunate enough to be invited to practice in the main dojo. When I first went to Japan in 1962, I became a problem because they didn't know what to do with me. Uh, first, normally, they put me in the women's dojo, and that was fun, and I learned a lot of skills, but I was killing the poor girls. Uh, they were not used to somebody uh, playing judo the way I was playing. I was playing regular judo, which uh, maybe at the time they, I, I was called exceptional. It was men's judo. They said, you're not doing women judo, you're doing men's judo. Well, what's the difference? I didn't know. I trained this hard. This is the way I came up. This is the way I train people, the way I came up. So they invited me into this main dojo, and which uh, affectionately called the Meat House. It's probably has mats, uh, maybe, uh, I don't know, hundreds and hundreds of tatamis. And uh, uh, actually, uh, that's where uh, I met my husband at Kodokan in 1962. And uh, just like the old adage, uh, years ago, the Japanese man walked in front and the woman walked behind. Well, that never happened to us or with us. Uh, we always walk side by side. And I'm very happy to uh, let you know that this November, we've been walking side by side for 45 years. <laughs> the, uh, actually, uh, when we first met at uh, Kodokan, uh, we were just friends, and uh, he had been scouted by several countries 
to uh, go and teach. He was uh, uh, on the Japanese Olympic coaching staff at that time in, 19, uh, in the early 60s. And then what I used to do for beer was arm wrestle, and I'd win because I'm left-handed, and all the Japanese are right-handed, so I'd take the businessmen and just knock them down one, two, three. So I had my little gimmicks going on. You always know how to get a beer in another country. <laughs> and it was amazing because uh, I stayed for the summit training, um, and uh, he, uh, uh, my husband went to, uh, back to his town, which is in southern Japan, in Kyushu, and uh, stayed with his family, and uh, the father had the television on, and he said, look, look, there's this woman in the, at Kodokan, look at her. He says, I know her, she's my friend, I, I see her all the time, I don't have to look at her. And the father looks, he says, mm, she's a big, strong girl, looks like she could probably have good babies. <laughs> so, uh, I didn't realize my father-in-law was a yenta at the time. <laughs> But it did work out, and yes, I did have big babies, and some of these babies are still big. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so uh, judo actually, uh, as as an aside, uh, it, it uh, gave me and still gives me uh, my purpose. It gave me direction. It gave me my family. It gave me my life. And uh, how could I not ever want to stop doing things for judo, people in judo, people around judo? Because I had uh, recruited and had more people, and they don't even know how I got them involved, helping judo. Anywhere from uh, the governor of New York to, uh, uh, to the former borough president, and people, uh, they didn't even realize, they didn't even know what judo was, but I convinced them because of my passion, not by my Coney Island confetti homogenized pitch, it was because of the passion and what I believed in and what I wanted for other people. So that was always a big help for the campaign and, and the crusade. There's people in the room that uh, they don't know how, but um, I, I said, I have a team coming from Germany. I didn't say how many, and I had, uh, uh, <laughs> Uh, this is a nice Jewish family, and I had this German, really, really German, really Deutschland team coming. And I said, can you house some of them? Said, sure. Well, I think I put about 20 of them <laughs> in, uh, to Judge Rubin's uh, house, fed them. There were thousands of boxes of cereal, and we had, uh, she don't know why she did it. <laughs> Still doesn't know why she did it. People don't know why they did things to help me in the cause, but they did. And um, it, it's amazing, and it all worked out well. And uh, in fact, uh, the, uh, the hot dog eating competition in Coney Island, in Athens, put two girls in it, and one from Germany, one from the US, and I coached them. And at the time, they beat the men, and they won first and second place. And one was like a little skinny 123 pounder, and the other one was a little bigger, and uh, they won the competition. So you never know. And we got more publicity for judo that day from a hot dog eating competition <laughs> because Alice Rubin was good enough to put this team up. So you figure how it would evolve. It was fantastic. And uh, Japan, that experience was, um, even though I thought I knew judo before I went to Japan, that's when I started to really learn judo. Uh, I love the principles. I love the fact that these were strong people, polite people, humble people, that you didn't have to run around with a bayonet on your shin to be tough. You didn't have to run around the street socking people to get respect. You had to first respect yourself, and that's what you got from judo. You cannot train so hard. Uh, you cannot feel animosity to your opponent. Uh, I remember bowing in, and we would go in this zare, in this kneeling position, and I would say, uh, this was the courtesy. You would bow in, and you'd say, please help me. And of course, you got up, and they threw you all over the place and beat you <laughs> up. And then 
you would finish and say, thank you very much. How, how, how more humble can you get? And after a while, I remember saying, Onigeshimas, please help me. And I say, God, please help me. Because it, got, it got to the point where you kind of, your body became numb at one point. But the experience, I got thrown by the best and occasionally I would catch them. And no one said, she's a girl. I mean, they knew it was. I wasn't in disguise anymore. But the respect was there. And the respect was there because of the way I was training and my attitude. My attitude was 100% giving and uh, no, no holding back and no uh, trying to get them, trying to prove anything. It was, I'm a, I'm a sponge. Teach me, show me, give me. And I, in turn, will uh, take it back to the United States and pass it on, which I did. Now, <laughs> Rusty the Geisha. <laughs> uh, the family that I stayed with in Japan, uh, actually uh, with Kobayashi family, Dr. Kobayashi. They gave me this yukata, looks like uh, people could call it a kimono, but it's a summer kimono called a yukata for my birthday, that was my birthday. And they gave me uh, geita, these shoes. Now I never wore high heels in my life. And these were sort of stilts with two wooden, things that you stand on, and if you don't have balance on these things, you're done. Well, anyway, even though the house is tatami, uh, the fact that these geta were never used in the street, and they wanted to take a photo of me, this was great. Um, I had the geta on, and the yukata, the kimono, and stood near the uh, screen doors, and Dr. Kobayashi was preparing his camera to take a photo, and he signaled me to go back a little bit, and I did. And I lost my balance. I went through the screen door, legs wide open. <laughs> Gate is flying any place. And uh, I think they got their photo of my birthday. <laughs> and that was, I put the gaiters, and I think I took them home, and they're probably still in the closet. But uh, it was a very nice gesture, and uh, nothing ever went normal with me, but it, it was a wonderful experience. Uh, this was the first U.S. women's team. Uh, we got to this point, um, 1974, we had our first, I had to actually uh, fight with the amateur athletic union. They would not let us have national competition. Um, I formed a competition in New York, uh, we had a, a club that allowed us, the uh, Daily News put us in the color section, we had several pages. I threatened the AAU, not with lawsuit at the time, but uh, threatened to have my own national championship. And they go, wait a minute, uh, this is getting out of control, uh, they're, they're losing the control, they have control of men's judo but not women's judo. Uh, why are women in judo? You don't belong in judo. And it was like, what do you mean we don't belong in judo? So it was the beginning of a good battle with the Amateur Athletic Union. Uh, finally, after um, intimidation, threats, and the usual bag of tricks, um, they allowed us in the national championships in 1974 in conjunction with the men's national championships. Well, it worked out pretty well um, out of New York. Uh, several members uh, of the uh, team were from uh, our club and uh, they won first place. Uh, the women, they did, well, a couple firsts and a couple uh, thirds, actually. And uh, I said, okay, uh, it's time to move on. We, we, now we have national championships, but I heard about the British Open. Let's go to international. Go, what do you mean, you can't go to international? And where are you gonna get the money and who's gonna go? I said, well, how about the team that won first place? Well, it took about a year and a half I raised money to get the team to Great Britain, um, sold these bizarre looking badges with women's hair flowing doing judo that uh, one of my students' fathers designed. They were so ugly, but everybody, it was, hi Rusty, give me a dollar. I gave them a you know, It was like some people said, I have 10 of these. I said, well, you need 11 because this is the way it is. But we raised the money and uh, took uh, we, the national, agreed, as long as they didn't have to give us money or do anything, they'd sign, then they uh, give us a sanction and, and um, 
a travel permit, so to speak, and we could take the top team and the first place when this we did, uh, including a coach, which I was elected as, and the manager, and we went to the British Open, which was the first, uh, the highest caliber of international competition until the first Women's World Judo Championship. And at the British Open, our first participation in 1976, proudly I can announce that uh, out of eight divisions, I believe we took seven gold. Mm -hmm. So, uh, U.S. was right in that ball game. There were only 20, I'm sorry, 12 countries participating at that time, mostly European. Uh, the Canadians were there and uh, South Africa for the first time. And uh, uh, you could see the uniform. I believe I convinced Bruce Jenner's company at the time to give me those warm-up suits. So, um, I was like the, the begging coach. We got the warm-up suits. Of course, even though we didn't have the support of the AAU or the money, we had to put the patch on. So, and we came home with our medals, and uh, uh, that was enough incentive for me. Not only did I think our team was doing great, but I looked at the other 11 teams. I said, hey, they're good. Women's judo was not just the United States. They're good. Let's do something. Let's do more. Well, by 1977, we had what was called the Pan American Championships. Uh, that was a prerequisite towards the future for the worlds. And that we had the St. Louis. And the way we had that was after the national championships. So the women that competed just competed in one competition and the same day competed in the second. And we did very well there. Also in 1977, because I knew now I was on a mission to get women's judo in the Olympics. I didn't even realize they had to have a world championship. I was on the mission and I said, we need more international experience. And I heard about the Maccabiah Games in Israel. And I said, hey, that, that should be good. Organized, got three women. They said, no, no, we, we're not gonna have women in the Maccabiah Games. I said, you have to have them in. What's it? And I studied their rules and laws and so forth uh, because I now became an advocate of studying uh, constitutions and bylaws of the International Olympic Committee, the United States Olympic Committee, the NG, the national governing body, or at the AAU at the time. Um, even though I wasn't a great student, all of a sudden I'm on this law thing because I have to, you have to know two things. You have to know the rules of engagement, but you also have to be able to have the guts to fight on the other side. Um, so the Makamiya Games, um, I found that you only had to have three countries participate in order to qualify. There were three. There were Israel, Netherlands, and the United States. Took three women over there, won two gold and one bronze. And grip fighting, I got a black eye. <laughs> but aside from that, it was great. Left them, they wanted to go to a kibbutz, and I came home, and came home with all people, with uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> because we met and uh, we had a mutual friend and he asked me, how did you get that eye? And I told him, your upper body's good but your legs are too skinny. So we became friends, we had crumpets and tea in uh, Heathrow Airport and uh, as my husband picked me up at uh, Kennedy Airport, they, they double, you know, where were you? What are you doing with him? You know? <laughs> so uh, you never know where sports takes you. Um, so that was our first official team. And actually, uh, just going over the races, uh, the team, uh, the woman in the middle, uh, Sandy Cornelius, uh, who's uh, since uh, uh, deceased, uh, is a full-blooded American Indian. And our team consisted of uh, four African-American women and four uh, Caucasian and um, an American Indian and Rusty. <laughs> uh, this was at the Maccabee Games and uh, this was our uniform uh, because actually um, how I convinced them, and someone told me I could do it. I, I wasn't sure if it was true. They said I could put an injunction on the plane so it couldn't leave. What, whatever, it sounded good and I threatened with that and I think they believed me because they were discriminating, but it worked, and they said, go, we're not giving you a dime, but go. Well, we went, won medals, had a chance to go to Meir uh, out of the corner of my eye, and Moisha Diane during opening ceremonies, and uh, I think a dove 
fell on my head as <laughs> we were going on, but it was, it, was, it was great, a great experience, and another international um, record for women's judo. Uh, the wedding. Uh, that was at the American Buddhist Academy, and the man who married us, uh, Reverend Seki, um, all I remember, he was standing uh, with this beautiful uh, formal kimono on. Uh, this is, uh, of course, we were dressed modern style. I didn't know one word he said at the time. <laughs> Whatever incense was in there, I was going, wow. <laughs> I don't know, I don't remember if I said I do or I don't, um, but uh, we were married. And uh, it was quite exciting. We had our reception at uh, Nippon Club, which was a Japan Society Club at the time. And, uh, well, and sushi was kind of rare in New York. So as the platters were being carried, the judo community vultures were just <laughs> grabbing them. And we, ne we, never, we never even got a piece of sushi at our own way. <laughs> but uh, that was it. That was, we, we made the move. And in those days, in 1964, there was still quite a bit of discrimination on uh, interracial marriages, and uh, we, uh, we did occasionally have to uh, sort of verbally, not defend ourselves, but kind of tell people off. And I remember when the kids were younger, um, at one point uh, when we were, in, I had the two of them, at, we were in the corner bank, and uh, one woman would say, oh, how nice you adopted these Vietnamese children. And uh, I looked, you know, that was one thing. But I think uh, the most amazing point was, um, as my husband is a good guy and says hello to everybody and a gentleman, um, in our one family house, he would look out the window upstairs and one of the neighbors, and then he'd wave, and then one of the neighbors said to me, uh, Oh, uh, that man that lives in your house. <laughs> you know, she couldn't imagine it was my husband. She said, uh, that man who lives in your house, he's very nice. He's such a gentleman. I said, yes, he's very nice. I go to bed with him once in a while. <laughs> so her mouth opened like that. <laughs> so uh, times have changed, thank goodness. But uh, you'd be surprised. Uh, and. Uh, in, uh, I, I don't know, in Japan, uh, when we went back in 1968, we did get some strange looks. Uh, fortunately, uh, my uh, brother, uh, my mom at the time, and um, my family, of course, embraced my, hus my husband and uh, his family. I mean, it was just fantastic. My father-in-law was thrilled when we were there in, in uh, 68. We were already, uh, he took me to all the judo schools. He wanted to show me off. Look, my daughter-in-law can kick your butt, you know. <laughs> so we ran around, and uh, he had his chance to meet his granddaughter, and uh, it, it was just great. So there was always a good relationship between the families. Uh, this is our dojo on Flatbush Avenue, and uh, some of you in the room may even be in the photo. Uh, you may not recognize yourself. But we had this club uh, for about 25 years or so, Flatbush Avenue, uh, Glenwood Road, and we had all the community kids in there, and uh, uh, we, they grew up with us, and uh, turned out some of them uh, have their own clubs now and doing well. I mean, they have regular jobs and school teachers or attorneys, or they all turned out, or well, at least the majority, pretty good. And um, there's a great photo of uh, Jean, who's in the audience. Um, you see the apple doesn't fall too far from the tree, and I taught her early on what to do with men. <laughs> and uh, I have a, a little video from, uh, that was at the Kyushu Club, and uh, some of the athletes are being interviewed, and maybe we can show that video. And this was uh, some of the athletes that actually were discriminated against uh, because of the lack of participation in the Olympics at that time.
sport that for many years has managed to keep women away from its competition. Many men believed that judo was a sport that women should not try to master. They considered it to be too difficult. But after many years of struggle, one lady has changed all that. Now, what you have to get in the habit of doing is when you complete it, in the time you are tired and... Almost 20 years ago, when Rusty Kanakogi wanted to enter the New York State Championship Judo Tournament, she had to pretend she was a man. I had uh, short hair and no makeup, and from training, I guess, I look mean or something, but it really fit. And uh, I entered as um, Rusty Stewart, which could pass for, you know, boy or girl at the time, or male or female. And um, I went into the competition, and I won. Indeed, she did. At one time, she was perhaps the most famous female judo performer in the world. She dominated in international matches, gave clinics for men in Japan, and was treated like a star. Until she came home. Then she had to wear a disguise just to do what she did best. My teammates were like hysterical, giggling, falling down. Not that I beat uh, male competitors, but just the fact that we, we got away with it, we thought. And uh, I was found out, and they brought me in a room and asked me to give my medal up, and um, I didn't want to give it up, and it was a matter then they threatened that other members from our team would be disqualified, so I gave it up. And um, then the next application that came out from either the AAU or the YMCA uh, start putting on their applications. They never put on their applications before that. After that, they put, must be a male. Rusty Kanakogi has been on a lifelong crusade to bring women into what is usually considered a violent male sport. She created the first Women's World Championship and got a U.S. women's judo team into this year's Pan American Games. William Simon, the president of the U.S. Olympic Committee, says it was Rusty who persuaded his committee to field a women's judo team for the 1988 Olympics. All this from a woman who teaches judo on weeknights in a small Brooklyn storefront right in the heart of the Flatbush neighborhood. I came into judo to calm down because um, being born and raised in Brooklyn, I didn't need judo to teach me how to defend myself. Um, I was kind of in gangs myself, and what judo did was the opposite. It calmed me down. I needed full contact. I needed some kind of physical outlet. And rather than fight in the street and go out and bother people, I found a sport that I could uh, uh, let that out in. Uh, more and more women are coming into judo for the sport part of it. We welcome the people that come in for the self-defense because if they stop that way, they soon find that they're through the techniques that they uh, could enjoy the sport. It is not a very glamorous life. The workout room is small and steamy. There is little space to move about. Yet Rusty does not let up. If you have never watched judo, then you will be stunned at the impact of a body slamming against the mat. But there is little discrimination. The women fight just like the men. This woman, Heidi Bowersax, won a gold medal at the Pan American Games. Leslie Conti has been the New York State women's champion in her weight division for the last six years. Rusty's daughter, 17-year-old Jean, is ranked second in the nation in her age group. Rusty's husband, Yohei Kanakogi, teaches as well. This family obviously intends to spread the message of judo. And there's nothing harder to teach women than men in judo. There's no difference as far as their uh, learning capabilities. Uh, one plus for women's uh, anatomy is the, the fact that their center of gravity is lower because of the way they're built. Uh, it's a plus because they can get their hip out a little further than men because their hip is larger than men's hips. After each year goes by, you learn that you have bettered yourself. Not in the sport, not that you've gotten better at the sport, and now you can throw as opposed to not being thrown, but your grades in school go up. Uh, your family life is very good, you're very respectful to your parents, you do your chores around the house, things like that. The mental and the physical together is more emphasized in judo than in basketball, volleyball, sports like that.
I started out dabbling in judo when I was about 11, 9 years old, 9, 10, 11. Then I really got into it when I was 12. I enjoyed it very much. I enjoyed the full contact, and it gave me good results outside. Maybe in seventh grade, the boys would bother me, and you know how seventh graders are. And I just uh, hate them, or I wouldn't be afraid to verbalize back. Meanwhile, most of the girls, they would run and cry to the dean, cry to the teacher. I'd beat them up first, and then I'd start crying to the teacher. Seems to help you even having a baby because uh, you you know you're a judo person that more is expected from you than the average athlete or another person in sport. Uh, the pride of judo goes right through you and you carry that to every phase of your life. But still for the women there is an underlying sense of bitterness that they are not being given an equal chance. <laughs> It's not clean, it's not too pretty, so you're going to get them down. Heidi Bowersacks, who is 24 and a registered nurse, is at the prime of her career, but she will not get a chance at the 1984 Olympics. The United States is not fielding a women's team, although there will be a team for the men. Oh, that's very upsetting. I've worked so hard to do it, and I feel that I'm in the prime right now. I worked very hard, and if I could go to Venezuela and represent the United States in the Pan Am Games and bring home a goal, why can't I go to Los Angeles when it's right here and also try to do the same thing again? Our men are in, in the Olympics, and as you see, we train with them, we do the same thing they do. The only difference between their judo and my judo is I wear a t-shirt under my judo gear, and they don't. Stay with us. Coming up next, Judy Jordan with some of the latest women's sports news. Um, every single stage of competition for the women had to be um, uh, either litigated for, including getting them into the sports festival, including getting them into um, the Olympic Training Center. Uh, the prerequisites were very important for the World Championship. After the British <laughs> Open, after the Maccabee Games and other competitions, I was never satisfied. I wanted the World Championships. And when um, I actually wanted the Olympics and was told that the World Championships was a definite prerequisite. Well, I said, okay, it has to be done. No country in the world wanted to hold the World Championships. They were afraid of the financial loss. They were afraid of lack of participation. Um, there were all kinds of uh, threats uh, if the women competed in it. Uh, there were scare tactics, how they would get hurt, um, whereas women already had been competing internationally uh, now for maybe five years at the uh, British Open and uh, other countries were uh, having competitions. Well, in February of 1980, the International Judo Federation finally awarded the United States the first Women's World Judo Championships. I had to sign the papers with the United States Judo that they would not be responsible for any part of it. They would accept the award of receiving it, but they would not host it, pay for it, or be involved. Well, I signed the papers. Signed the papers for that, Signed the papers for my house being <laughs> deposited. Uh, let my husband know that a little later. Um, <laughs> so I figured, you know, we, that, that, that wasn't a key point at the time. Um, thanks to uh, thanks to my friends, thanks to my dojo, my family, uh, we pulled it together because I didn't realize when in February when we opened the first bank account that was $116, that's what we had, and the cost of the First Women's Worlds would be $180,000. And uh, well, the monies would come from different sources, and uh, I tell you, thank goodness for Coney Island, the wheeling and dealing and the chutzpah, because whatever I had to pull, I pulled. I had, uh, 
I got a deposit from the international, for the International Judo Federation. I was selling television rights um, on behalf of the International Judo Federation. Uh, they were selling television rights. I sold too many television rights. <laughs> um, CBS kicked ESPN out of the room because they said you can't do both. Um, that helped. Um, I got sponsorship from uh, uh, the selling the journal, convinced everybody. In fact, um, as I don't know if any of you women or men for that matter in the room get crank calls from crazy people who uh, ask you what you're wearing in the middle of the night or <laughs> breathing deeply and, and there are some folks that actually like, um, you know, you're a strong woman, can you hurt me? Oh, you bet I can. Until you realize that something's wrong with them. This is the way they want you to speak. Well, when I was getting those calls, I was actually selling them tickets to the world. You know, I said, wait a minute, you like strong women? You can get tickets for them. You know? So where, wherever, wherever I could hustle, I was hustling. When um, the, uh, my, my most important ally, Dr. Shigeyoshi Matsumai from uh, Japan, who was the president of the International Judo Federation, he, he became my number one ally in the whole world and a dear friend who I love and miss. Um, well, because he was so important, and the president of the university, and he initially invented the underwater cable, so he was a pretty wealthy guy, and all the companies wanted to know him, and the politicians, and wanted to take care of him. Well, every time someone called me and see if I can arrange a luncheon date for when he came into town, I said, well, I'll do my best, but in the meantime, I know he would be very happy if you bought 50 <laughs> tickets uh, for Madison Square Garden. So I was hustling whoever I could hustle. I think I even asked Dr. Matsumai to buy a page in the program. It was w whatever I could do because I had to get this money raised. Um, we had t-shirts. I had to give the referees a, a stipend every day. I was having people run around the hotel and outside the hotel selling t-shirts. Uh, I remember being in Tiffany's because the Japanese ambassador at the time that was in New York said, we want to make a presentation at the first Women's World Judo Championships. And uh, they said, to select something and give us, you know, bill us. Well, I got the idea, sterling silver, Apple, for the best technician of the day. I don't know whoever that was going to be. And uh, I was kind of raggedy and running around like crazy. and. Uh, I had myself and my Indian companion, Sandy, who I introduced you to before, and uh, another woman by the name of Gigi, a nice lady from Jersey, but Gigi was like, you know, Laverne and Shirley, she was like Laverne. And uh, here we are in Tiffany's, and I have on shorts, and uh, Sandy's standing there like the wooden Indian, and uh, Gigi is going, man, look at all this great stuff here. You know? <laughs> And in the meantime, I find the apple when I pick it out, and the salesman who was huffed and puffed, and I said, "Okay, I need, I need that. This is what I need engraved." And uh, he said, "How will you be paying?" I said, "No, no, bill it to the Japanese ambassador." Well, he had one finger ready to go on the button uh, for the for the great robbery because you know. And he finally, I can finally convince him to make the call, and he did, and that worked out fine. And uh, the athlete that won that was uh, 48 kilo woman from uh, Great Britain, her name is Jane Bridge, who still has her apple on her, uh, on her mantle. So that was, that was just one little thing. Even the warm-up suits, every phase of that. Well, got the world championships done. Uh, one of the heart attacks of the whole overall picture was prerequisite that the International Olympic Committee said, you have to have 25 countries minimum. <gasps> heart attack. Every, I was, every day, the mail, the mail, I need another country, I need participation. Well, it turned out we got 27 countries. Actually, um, Bangladesh um, registered, but they never showed up. And we think maybe they just took a bath someplace and disappeared. And <laughs> we, we couldn't figure that one out. But we actually had 27 countries participate, so we hit the prerequisite. And um, it took a while, and we got everything done, and, and it was a historic event with uh, great support, and um, it, it was the beginning. And after that, okay, we did the Worlds, now we want the Olympics. Well, there's still questions. Well, what's the questions? How did it affect the women's health? 
and their bodies. Well, okay, specifically, IOC's question. They were very concerned that it would hurt the women's reproductive organs. I said, well, I've been in judo for 30 years and I have kids and they may have been dysfunctional, but they were born. <laughs> So, you know, you know, so, okay, well, what about the breasts? Well, what about them? You know, they're not a problem. And um, with the reproduction organs, you have to remember, women, we're inside. Men is the, what you have to be concerned about. Not the women, you've got to be concerned about the men. You know, you've got a little problem here. Well, also, we're very concerned once women are doing mat work and they're lying on each other, it may encourage lesbianism. Uh, oh, especially if they're choking or ripping your arm out of your sock. Well, certainly you're going to fall in love with somebody. So whatever they, they, they were coming up with the stupidest things that we could really blow them out of the water, uh, they, they really didn't know what to do. So it, again, it was not a given. It had to be a campaign. It had to be litigation. It had to be, uh, once we were told in 1984, uh, when we expected to get the note of approval, the nod of approval, that we could not be in, and I pulled in the American Civil Liberties Union in California. We, we had a, a massive, uh, a massive uh, press conference, pulled in whoever I could. Um, went further than that, ACLU was representing us. We're going to go to the, the Luzerne, Switzerland, the International Women's Law uh, headquarters because they're in Luzerne. They could sue the IOC for discrimination. I had already proved it in New York. Uh, Governor Cuomo and the Division of Human Rights helped me prove that. Uh, so I was getting this education uh, as I was going step by step. I had a lot of people helping. Uh, giving me direction and correct direction. We got politicians on my side, uh, people coming in financially to help me pay for some of the phones and, and, and different things I was using. And finally, um, uh, of course, there's so many stories in between. And finally, uh, the Dr. Matsumai, he, he came in the legitimate way for the International Judo Federation with the uh, International Olympic Committee. I came in with everything from putting an injunction on the 1988 Olympic money in Seoul because corporate headquarters were here in New York, NBC at the time, and we already proved that a corporation could not go into a contract with any company that has already been found guilty of discrimination. So I had a lot going on. Uh, some of, m none of it hit the court. Everybody conceded before it hit the court because it was like I was getting on everybody's nerves. Uh, the president of the uh, International Olympic Committee, Sam Ranch, I gave his mailman uh, a hernia with uh, the mail. He had to trudge back and forth and, and uh, IOC couldn't make their points anymore. It, uh, they even said, no, no, women's judo is a new event. I said, no, it's the same old judo it's from 1964 that has been in for men and with just another gender going into judo. So uh, whatever obstacle they could throw in the way, they did. And uh, fortunately, uh, finally, they conceded. We went in for the first time in 1988. Uh, it was uh, an awesome event. It was history. Uh, the world of judo now, had the participation has doubled because of the amount of women. Uh, Japan, most of the medals they win now in international competition is by the women. Um, although their men are still you know, superb, uh, the women are coming home with the gold. And uh, the United States, our recent uh, medals have been, again, from the women, from the uh, last Olympics, we took a bronze, and the junior worlds, we took a gold. So by not having women participate, uh, you're doing a couple things. Uh, you're undermining women, you're undermining their credibility, you're undermining them as athletes and as human beings. And uh, it may be judo, but basically it's the social life throughout the world. And there isn't a country in the world, even in Muslim countries now, uh, even in Iran, uh, women are, are wearing a, sort of a, a legitimate type of head uh, covering and they're competing. And this is, this is just the beginning. And to me, sports opens up the world because I remember uh, before formerly uh, East Germany, DDR, it wasn't appropriate to be friends with them. I was friends with them. Soviet Union, 
uh, I was friends with them, not the government. I don't hold the athletes responsible for their government, just like they don't hold us. So the communication through sports uh, is incredible. Uh, I, whether it, the communication through maybe your jobs um, is important, but through sports, when you sweat together, when you bleed sometimes together, you know, when, when the truth comes out, whether it be on the mat or the playing field, um, there, there's a release that happens and a mutual respect. Uh, so to me, it's, I, I've had a fantastic life. It's been hard, not just on myself, but my family, because uh, how many times it was like, oh, don't bother me, uh, McDonald's is three blocks away, I'm busy on the phone, I'm setting up. So I had the support of the family, sometimes uh, whether they wanted to support me or not, <laughs> it was like, uh, um, I appreciate that. You pay a price, but you don't think of it. You never think about a reward. If you're looking for thanks, forget about it. You may get thanked 30 years later, and then it's like, this is amazing. You're, you're, you're amazed. Uh, the recent award that I received from Japan was absolutely amazing. Uh, the uh, people that received it was uh, uh, former uh, Vice President Mundale, um, who did a lot of Japanese relationship and so forth. And then uh, Tommy Lasorda, who did a lot of the baseball stuff for Japan and why we have so many great Japanese ball players and uh, myself. So I was in pretty good company and uh, uh, that was probably the highest honor. I mean, it's, to me, it's the Academy Award. Um, before Dr. Uh, uh, Sackle mentioned uh, the Lee Krasner as my aunt, uh, if you know anything, a little bit about art, uh, Lee was one of my role models in the sense of I liked that, I didn't like that she was hit over the head, but I liked the way they couldn't keep her down. And no matter what, she, uh, I mean, she had, of course, Pollock, that's enough to really knock somebody for a loop. And the uh, first time I met Pollock, in fact, I met him at my grandmother's house in Huntington, Long Island, at her farmhouse. And uh, I remember, I liked Lee's boyfriend, uh, Igor, a heck of a lot better. He was a good-looking guy and very personable, and I was a little kid, and he was always nice to me. And uh, then all of a sudden, I don't see Igor, but who do I see? This uh, Pollock guy. And I took one look at him, and he said, uh, hi, Rini. I said, oh, I don't like him. I mean, he didn't, even, he didn't even call me by my right name, and I was almost about to say something, and then my mother gave me a little pinch, and I shut my mouth. And, um, that was, but obviously they hit it off, and uh, then uh, their history is very well known. And several years ago, I uh, uh, I was asked to uh, coach Marcia Gay Harden, who played Lee Krasner in the Pollock film, and uh, I did. And when she came to our home and, and lay down in Lee's bed, and, and I filled her in, and we kind of covered the Brooklyn accent a bit, uh, which I don't have anymore. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I told uh, Marsha she was going to win the Academy Award. And she said, oh, you know, a million years she didn't think of it. Actually, I thought Pollock, uh, not Pollock, but Ed Harris should have won. Uh, Ed had asked me uh, what I thought of her uh, initially, and uh, I, I thought she was a good match. Um, Lee had a very hard time as a painter because, one, she... Um, Lee would tell it the way it is. She would not mince her words. When it came to the critics, she didn't schmooze them. She told them the way it was, and they didn't like it. Critics love to be stroked. They love to be handled, and she didn't do it. She was honest, forthright. Her work was very strong. Um, her teacher, Hans Hoffman, actually um, will maybe get on to that in a few minutes on the uh, PowerPoint, uh, told her she was great, that she painted like a man. At the time, she took it as a compliment. I thought, I was complimented when I was told, Rusty, you're judo, you're good, you fight like a man. We never, at that time, uh, thought anything negative of that. That was the best compliment you could be, or receive, rather, be compared to a man, and be equal, holy mackerel, it doesn't get better than that. Of course, now, later years, you realize, even though the intention was not to, uh, to hurt you, but the intention was good, but why couldn't you paint like a good woman or fight like a good woman? See, so times have changed, 
And um, uh, with Lee, uh, maybe we can go on. We can, I have something on Lee if we can get to that. Okay, uh, this was the trials for the first Women's World Judo Championship. It was at the Penta Hotel, which is the plaza, which was the Statler, that now I think has bed bugs. <laughs> that was the last I heard. Uh, that was the last I heard. Uh, this was at the first World Championship, Dr. Matsumai, and uh, had Paul Gez, who owned Sasson at the time. Uh, he uh, got him involved. He don't know how or why, but got him very involved, and he was a big sponsor. And uh, I was convincing uh, Mario Cuomo to help us, uh, first verbally and then physically. <laughs> and some of the articles in the newspaper, the press, uh, I was the darling of the press. Everybody wanted the story of what was going on with women judo and this discrimination bit. And they really, really helped. The power of the press is magnificent. A few articles. Um, one, the IOC was discriminating against us and um, what we would do, do about it. And this is at the American Civil Liberties Union in uh, Los Angeles, 1984, the huge press conference I referred to a little while ago. And this was our inclusion uh, in the Olympics, 1988. That's my uh, team, uh, Margaret uh, Maji Castro, Lynn Rothke, Eve Aronoff Travella, and myself. And uh, uh, the uh, other photo is of our warm up suits. And uh, I, the only thing I can compare, although I was grateful to receive it, we look like Quakers marching <laughs> on. Uh, some articles, uh, it was, uh, I think, appealing to the public to see a woman taking a man's arm off. Yeah. So, it was always a dynamic photo besides a throw. This was an arm bar. And this was the centerfold of Sports Illustrated. And uh, this is our club that, in fact, this is not trick photography. That is one of my students who has gone on to become uh, uh, his students and now making the Olympic team. And uh, he's doing a, a rollout right over my head. I think he had to do it about 80 times. And uh, he had a cold that night. And uh, the point of the whole thing is I didn't blink. <laughs> the, uh, this was a, a centerfold in uh, Esquire magazine. And uh, anything for the press. And there's something about uh, uh, six women who can wipe you out. They had everything from a woman with a whip to uh, a motorcycle driver and, and myself and um, we, we utilize any type of magazine if they asked us to do something we did it and uh, we got we got attention for whatever we were promoting and uh, this is up on the hill uh, it's uh, Billy Jean and one of our friends uh, we go up on the uh, we go up on the hill every February to uh, get uh, Congress and Senate not only to uh, continue to support Title IX but also to enforce it uh, because uh, even though uh, it has been very helpful and many women have benefited, we always have to keep reminding them because it's not always a given. Uh, this is an article that I thought should have been included here. Uh, because being lonely as an outsider, like judo, what's judo? Even my mother didn't even know because somebody said, what does your daughter do? Well, my daughter does Judy. Well, <laughs> what the heck is that, you know? Um, she, she couldn't even get the term right. The, uh, finally landed up with big league with uh, pro football, basketball, and the like. And uh, calling uh, myself and a couple other women in the photo, uh, sports legends. So that really put judo up uh, on a pedestal, which I thought was about time. Not necessarily for me, but for the sport itself. And uh, this is at the uh, Women's Sports Foundation. This is when I was inducted into the uh, International Women's Sports Hall of Fame. And the Women's Sports Foundation is uh, the main international women's um, uh, entity that helps athletes uh, not only uh, not only elite athletes, but uh, 
uh, athletes and girls to teach them how to stay fit, healthy, to grow properly, uh, to participate in sports, to be helpful, advocacy. So if you ever have a chance, go to their webpage, Women's Sports Foundation. They have a lot of good stuff going on. And um, uh, this, uh, this picture is kind of rare. That's Lee Krasner painted by Hans Hoffman. At the time, I think uh, she was his uh, friend, girlfriend. So Hans Hoffman could have been my uncle too, so you never know. <laughs> um, and then there's an article that uh, really bugged me, and uh, Barbara Streisand uh, was going to do a film with Robert De Niro about Lee and uh, Pollock, and uh, somebody mentioned a story, and there was a man out, a critic out in uh, East Hampton, who's probably still annoyed with Lee, and turned around and said, well, Streisand's going to have to get funnier looking or worse looking mm -hmm. to, to play Lee. And uh, I got in touch with Cindy Adams, and I blew my top and I said, what's wrong with Robert De Niro? Lee is his godmother. Uh, how can he let this guy get away with that? And uh, anyway, it was a little article, but it's a shame because nobody ever said Pollock's looks. Pollock's, you know, he's this or he's that. It was Lee, why? Because she's a woman. So same thing, the struggle in the sports world is the struggle in the art world is the struggle in the business world. Of course, we're, rise, we're rising up. There's still a way to go. Um, I'm sure nobody in this room is trying to repress anyone, let alone women, but uh, we're still in the ball game where we gotta prove ourselves and be the best that we can do, whether, whether you're in law enforcement or whether you're in, uh, in the legal system or whatever you're doing. You have to always be better. And uh, I hope when my granddaughter and maybe her granddaughter, that'll all be done. And uh, uh, the, uh, that's uh, Marsha Gay Harden and my husband and I in front of, uh, I think the name of the painting is Celebration. It might be over at the Whitney, uh, one of Lee's works. And uh, that's when uh, Ed Harris and I met at uh, the house at East Hampton, uh, which is the museum, uh, Paula Krasner house. And we were talking about uh, the film he was coming up with. and. Uh, the, I have a friend, I think, Ernestine, is she still in the room? Yeah, sure. Oh, okay. Uh, we were in the Rose Garden at the White House, and I have that photo hanging up with um, former President Clinton, and everybody said, what are you telling him? <laughs> well, that's, that's the question. What am I telling him? And if anybody can come up with the answer, there's a $5 bill in it for you. <laughs> Think, think your best thought and your worst thought, because I'm not going to reveal it until somebody hits upon it. Uh, the uh, uh, last photos, I believe, are um, at the uh, reception uh, at the uh, Ambassador's residence when I was presented uh, the uh, Emperor's Award, and then a dinner uh, that uh, the Black Belt Association of New York, uh, Hudson United Chicago, actually held for uh, another uh, an award that, that I received. And uh, my distinguished partner over there. Um, I, I think this might be the end of the films, yeah, uh, the pictures. Uh, we may have a little time for questions. We don't have any time for questions, okay? So thank you very much. And but for paving the way, for recognizing really the challenges and difficulties we still face, but having made such enormous, enormous strides for women in sports. I, I also want to let you know 
that the stars have come into another alignment. It was my former husband that produced Pollock. <laughs> so, uh, March 21st is our second anniversary. We're going to celebrate with a speak out in the auditorium, Women's Visions for the Nation. What's it going to take? I think we've had a little bit of a, a preview today, uh, March 21st, between 2 and 4. And then at 4 o'clock, up here in the galleries, we're going to have a reception and an opportunity to speak with all of the wonderful people who are participating in that panel, including um, Laura Flanders, who is going to be our, um, our moderator for that day. So thank you all for coming. Rusty, thank you so very much. My pleasure. Thank you. in the back of the room about our programming here, and you can go online to the Elizabeth A. Sackler Center uh, for Feminist Art and see all the things that we're doing. Thank you. Thank you.